Hi folks, welcome to this video on the law in sport. Now this one um, is one of those areas that's linked to uh, the deviancy section of the syllabus, but obviously it's about the law and how it is there to protect players and, you know, I suppose problems with it and issues with it. What we're going to look at is how the law's recently changed in terms of sport and some of the problems that's, that's created. I suppose what we should start with is uh, this thing here. Common law is essentially the law of the land, the law that which we live by in the UK. Uh, that governs us of what we can do and what we can't do. And we've also got sport law. Now, for years and years, these two are slightly different to each other. You know, examples where if you punch someone on the street, you're going to get, you know, arrested and charged under common law. If you punch someone on a, football on a football field or something like that, it was almost seen as like half acceptable. Oh, that's just, that can happen in football, you know, don't worry about it. So there was a lot of separation between sport law and common law. Now what we're seeing is, there is they are much more closely knit together, okay? They are much more closely, they've come much more in line with each other. Sports law and common law, okay? So why is sport law and common law become more... In line with one another. Well, you know, the law is there to protect people as it is to protect performers. Performers are people. It's also a standard by which all must follow. So, you know, it's not good enough to say, well, you need to follow these rules, but as an athlete, you don't have to. As a footballer, you don't have to. As a rugby player, you don't have to. But the main driving factor is this. As sports become more and more commercial, as we see on TV and the internet and in the papers and on the radio all the time, everywhere, Sport needs to set a good example for society and for the people of society. If it doesn't do that, then, you know, it shouldn't be given the high prestige and high focal point that it gets. So that is why sports law is becoming more and more in line with common law. And you might think that's a good thing, but obviously for every argument, there's a counter argument. What? Many governing bodies, national and international, don't like is the fact that they can now not self-regulate their sports. You know, the, the control of their sports and what athletes can and can't do is somewhat out of their control now. And you might go, well, that's fair enough. And I, I tend to agree, but it is, it is a, is a counter-argument if you want to think of it like that. Also, governing bodies, national and international, don't like the fact that they cannot set their own laws anymore. They, you know, they like to be judge and jury of their sports, they like to impose sanctions, they like to impose penalties uh, on performers who've been, you know, behaved badly and things like that. And obviously the more of the law that get, goes into common law and away from sport law, the less they can do that and they don't like it. But that's the state of affairs, that's the way it is now. So what we're going to do now is look at the impact of law uh, on sport and certain aspects of sport. So firstly, let's have a look at the law and the performers. Now, <laughs> I don't want to word it in any particular way, but I suppose this is one way of looking at it. These are the five ways in which the law protects performers, but also punishes certain performers. I suppose what I'm trying to say is the five that we're going to look at now is the way that performers interact with the law. So depending on how the question is worded in your exams, these are the points, these are the five points you've got to think about and then apply to the question that is given to you should a question come up on law and its relationship with the performers in sport. So in no particular order, let's look firstly at the Bosman ruling. Now, Bosman was um, a former footballer uh, himself, and you're, all, you're listening to this, you're all going to be too young to remember this, the days before the free transfer came in. But at this time, before Bosman went to the Court of Human Rights, the High Court, when a player's contract was up, expired, they could not move to another club under a free transfer. They couldn't just go, well, my contract's up, so I can now go to anyone I want to for free if they want me. You still had to be paid for. So a club could literally let your contract run out and then decide not to sell you or put a massive asking price on your head so that no club would be willing to pay that amount for you and that'd be the end of your career because you're stuck at a club that don't want you anymore, but you can't move to one of their rivals. So Bosman went to the High Court and said, this is an impingement of my human rights. If I was employed as a teacher, as a doctor, if I was working in a factory, if my contract came to an end, I would be totally free to go and find employment elsewhere. But I can't as a footballer. And the Court of Human Rights said, that's absolutely right. That needs to change immediately. So the Bosman ruling came in. And as I've put there, sorry for that really long-winded description, but a lot of people struggle with getting their head around it. When the Bosman ruling came in, it basically said, when your contract is up, if, if you are not signed to a new contract by your existing club, you can move on a free transfer to any other club in Europe. So, you know, it's within the EU, but the Bosman ruling is a way that the law protects performers and the way that common law, your rights to earn a living, has come into sports law. 
Right, so next, this guy winds me up. How he's still allowed to compete is absolutely beyond me, but the way that the law comes into effect now is if drug people are found guilty of taking drugs, they should be banned and they will face sanctions from the relevant national governing body. Now, that's obviously not to protect them, that's to punish them. It's there to protect the people who are clean, the performers who are not taking drugs. You shouldn't have the ability to earn a living and earn titles taken away from you by people who are breaking the law of sport but by taking illegal substances. He said two drugs bans now Gatlin and he's still allowed to compete. You know, if he was British, he would have been banned for life by now. He's American, he's only been banned well, he's been, only been banned, he's been banned twice but let back in twice, which I think is totally wrong. And Wader, you know, the World Anti Doping Agency needs to bring in lifetime bans for, you know, second time offenders. Maybe even lifetime bans for first time offenders. That would send a strong enough message. But the law as it stands right now is drug cheats will be banned and face sanctions from their national governing bodies. And the other three, just so I'm not dawdling on and wasting your time, uh, the other three ways that the law affects the performers, one here is um, the fact that violence and racism can now be prosecuted by the Crown Prosecution Service. Quite right so. So, you, you know, someone suffers a career-ending horrific tackle by a player, and it was deliberate, there was intent to harm the player there. The player committing the tackle can now be prosecuted, you know, for a violent act, for loss of earnings, if it does end the career of the performer. Equally racist acts, quite rightly so as well. Think of John Terry and Anton Ferdinand. Terry was tried by the FA, so internally by the governing body, but Anton Ferdinand also took it to the Crown Prosecution Service. You know, racism should not be acceptable in sport. It's not acceptable in the rest of society, so why should it be acceptable in sport? So that protects players as well. Another one is, players cannot gamble on sports events they have influence over. So you don't even need to be playing. If you are in that squad or you are privy to information from that team or squad or that performer, you cannot gamble on that event or that game or whatever. Because, you know, we've got too many, you know, events where there's match fixing and spot fixing going on. We don't want it. We don't have accusations of it. So the law is you cannot gamble on an event you have uh, influence over. And finally, a fairly simple one, contracts. If you sign for a club, you'll sign a contract and that contract is signed by you, the player, often your agent, the manager and the club themselves or a club representative, often the chairman or chairwoman. And that protects your rights, the performer, but it also protects the club's rights. So that contract will say how long you are signed to that club for, how much you can expect to get paid, you know, any extra things you need to do, community work, you know, media responsibilities, things like that. If they start going above that, they'll have to pay you more. But equally, if you do things like take drugs or are violent or do something bad and bring your name and your club's name to disrepute, that contract can be torn up in order to protect the club. So that's there to protect both parties. So, uh, excuse me. So anything to do with the law uh, and the performers, they're the five key pieces of legislation that are there, that have influence, that interact with the performers, that protect the performers. So next on to the law and the officials. And again, this is, you know, the officials' responsibilities with regards to the law. So there's three things we need to talk about here. So again, in no particular order, bribery and corruption and, bribery and, corruption and gambling. So again, officials as like players, performers, are not allowed to gamble or place money on games that they are involved with. Okay, there's been, you know, many examples. Robert Hoyes is probably one of the most quoted ones. He was a German Referee who was found, he was all he was gambling as well as uh, having allegations of bribery against him for German football games he was in charge of. So, you know, trying to influence the results of games that you are officiating over. So, if that's you know, if you're investigating and found that you've been bribed or you're gambling, you will be prosecuted. It's as simple as that. Sports should be unpredictable, the results should not be predetermined. So, the fact that someone's going out there trying to predetermine the result, you know, goes against the law. Um, secondly, then, is duty of care. Now, referees, officials have a duty of care to performers and spectators. So it might be things like this. Checking the state of the pitch, is it playable? Checking boots and checking your kit and checking that the nets are tied down and the pitch is okay to play on, you know, in terms of potholes and things like that. That's their job to make sure that the performers are safe but also to make sure the spectators are safe. Is everything okay in and around the ground? Are they far enough back? Is there enough CCTV and steward presence to make sure that everyone's at, you know, not at, uh, sorry, there's no risk there that's totally unavoidable. We need to control all the risks that's there. And finally, 
there's negligence and basically how can we uh, sum this up it's incorrect application of rules now unfortunately there have been more than one incidents of rugby players in particular suffering life-changing injuries such as paralysis or even dying due to a broken neck where referees for example have not been enforcing the rules of the scrum properly so the scrum is very very complicated but if you're a qualified official you should know how to enforce the rules of the scrum if you are not doing that repeatedly and a player suffers an injury then you can be sued for negligence because you were not doing your job properly so, you know, negligence takes place. In, you know, if you were a personal trainer in a gym and you knew some equipment was broken or damaged and you just didn't bother putting a sign up on it saying out of order and someone went on it and injured themselves, you would be negligent and you'd be quite rightly, you know, eligible to be sued. Same with an official. People are going there to play a sport, not to risk life and limb. Um, so it is, you know, an important one. So these are the ways that the, uh, the loan officials interact with each other and this is what the officials need to be aware of. Finally then, with regard to the law, managers, agents, directors and owners. Now there's two branches that this can go down um, and we'll just make sure that we cover both sides of it. One of the biggest is the contracts. We've mentioned them already, but you know, it goes without saying they must be legal. There's been plenty of stories in football about, you know, illegal payments, under the desk payments. This player wants to sign for so-and-so, so -and -so, but the agent has got involved and now with this kind of payment and this kind of contract that isn't technically legal, you know, you could move to this club, etc., etc. You know, even trying to buy promising juniors for X amount of money and things like that. You know, we've had ones where, was it Barcelona in recent years, were banned from signing any more players uh, due to illegal transfers and things like that. In rugby, we've got salary caps that can be breached. You know, you breach the club's salary cap, therefore... You're paying you know, more money out than other clubs, so that's unfair to them. So there are lots of things going on in terms of legal and illegal payments. And you know that's got to be stamped out. But the biggie for me um, is something that's happened... Oh, sorry, this event didn't happen recently, but news about this event has happened recently. And that's the tragedy that was the Hillsborough disaster and uh, the recent inquest exonerating uh, the Liverpool fans uh, and bringing in the likelihood... As, I've, as I'm doing this video now, of a prosecution for, you know, 96 counts of uh, unlawful uh, manslaughter, which is, you know, going to be levelled at the police and the uh, police chief on that day, you know, cause it, as it turns out, has been long suspected it was their fault, their cover-up for the death of those 96 fans. So, you know, with particular looking at the people that we've got at the top here, managers, agents, we're looking at directors and owners here. They have a duty of care to the spectators. These people went to watch a game of football and 96 of them lost their life. That shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen in any walk of life, least of all a sports event. You know, sadly, as with a lot of things in life, we don't learn from things until it's too late. But, you know, the Hillsborough disaster, what that's highlighted and what that's brought in to change in terms of the law is, you know, the fact that all stadia built now, all seats are stadia, unless, you know, there's, there's a... You know, a cost issue for low league clubs, I know that. But if you can't have all seats at Stadia, then at least we have ticket allocations. Instead of that stand where those poor 96 people died, holding between twelve and 14,000. Well, how many does it hold? Twelve or 14? Because that's how many tickets we sell, no more. Um, the removal of the pitch side fences, you can just make them out there that they got crushed to death on. Um, you know, an adequate emergency exits that aren't locked. I mean, we're talking about a time where they shoved more people into a, into a st stand that it could hold with fences at the, at the front to stop them getting on the pitch and then locked the doors in behind them. I mean, what did they think was going to happen in that situation? But, you know, they didn't technically break the law as it was at the time then. You know, thankfully it's changed, but, it, you know, it was too late. Or it is too late. And obviously turn styles to stop just people charging in and running in who haven't got tickets, you know, only let those people with a ticket in to the stadium. So, you know, directors and owners have a duty of care to ensure that all this is in place so that we don't have another Hillsborough disaster. So all these things about law are about how we're trying to protect people, how we're trying to prosecute the guilty and protect the innocent. So what you've got to do is have these ideas floating around in your head and then apply it to the question that comes up. Good luck with it. Hope you found this video useful, folks.